I think, in terms of knowledge economy formation. And then uh, tell you a little bit about our firm and have some time for questions afterwards. Uh, so uh, anyway, we'll jump right in. So our mission is to build Montana companies of impact, utility, and meaning. So specifically, we've raised $21 and $8 million. Uh, we just had our close about 10 days ago uh, after 18 months of fundraising. So. <laughs> raise money knows that it's, it's, it's not an easy process. Um, 18 months seems like a long time. Hopefully it won't take you guys that long if you ever go and raise money. But um, the best thing about it is the, how your story changes over the time and how quickly you understand the questions you're going to get asked. But also who you need to ask for money. You know, um, our investors, uh, just to give you a little story on that, really have three characteristics. Um, the first is their high net worth. They're individuals mostly. The second is they have an appetite for risk, and the third is they have a passion for Montana, and they think Montana's changing and deserves to have the capital available for its people here. Uh, what did I learn in the process of raising money? If you call someone that doesn't have the Montana connection and ask them for venture capital uh, investments to fund Montana companies, like say you call someone from Chicago or uh, LA or New York, and they've never been in Montana, they think you're nuts. Um, so, um, like any sales process, understanding your audience, people that have a pre-existing bias to believe your thesis is really important to us. It turns out Montana is this paradox because there's so much wealth in Montana that either lives here and recreates here uh, or has come to love it, and yet there's so little capital available, which I'll go through in the middle. And so, in many ways, what the, way, the role I see myself playing is, is kind of matching a capability between the people with wealth who have a passion to see Montana succeed and thrive and the people in Montana that need that capital to do so. And so that's really at the crux of what we do. We've made three investments to date um, and I'll go through a few of those and hope to by the end of this year have done another three, so I'll be six investments in a couple of years. Um, and uh, the other thing I'll just say before I get started is um, there's this chicken and the egg problem when you talk about raising a venture capital fund from Montana, uh, typically people say things like, well, if there were good companies in Montana, money would have shown up there. Therefore, there must be no good companies in Montana since there's no money here. And if you, that's really an academically probably accurate argument in the sense that the theoretical view of capital flows is that capital will flow like water to where it should be and it'll flow and chase return. And so if you don't see capital, you can conclude there must be no return possibility. And I, I, I really think that's wrong. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about why I think that's, why there may be some other factors that explain why Montana has been so poorly capitalized historically. Um, I don't think that, that it's true. Um, maybe at a certain size, maybe when you're doing five or 10 or $15 million in revenue, and people can call you from all over the country and say, tell me about your business. They'll get on a plane and come visit you, but when you're, you know, maybe you've been out in a year and a half or two years and you don't really have much to show for it, um, no one's gonna come. So, the well, how bad is the lack of capital in Montana? And now these numbers are from the NBCA, so uh, I'm gonna use my little laser pointer here. According to the numbers that I found when I went into fundraising mode, there's about less than $1 million is invested. This is official stats from the NBCA that maybe some angel funding that taken more than that, but according to the National Venture Capital Association with the recording of it, it's really bad. So what does that mean? It basically means that there, effectively there's no money in Montana for founders who want to build businesses. And coastal VC firms that are, you know, even Colorado or Utah firms that are, that, are, that maybe have capital and they will express some concept of being willing to invest in our market here, they're, they're really only going to show up once it's no-brainer. They're not, I don't think they're going to come here and do the hard work to start things. Uh, and if it's a no-brainer, then they will. Like right now, I think raised $60 million from uh, Big Lock and Summit Partners, but well after it was an established business. Um, and there's some serious ramifications for, for company formation, for, for job growth, for economic development. Um, and particularly when you think about companies that aren't going to generate revenue from day zero. Um, biotech companies, for example, that won't generate any revenue until they have an FDA-approved drug or software companies where it may take 18 to 24 months to be able to get a product that people are willing to pay for. Um, I think uh, uh, 
we'll talk a little bit more about that. So how do we compare to Colorado and Utah? And the reason I pick Colorado and Utah is that I think that it's reasonable, certainly if you think about Utah, it's reasonable to compare Montana to Utah. Utah has two and a half million people, um, and Colorado's got about five million people. But uh, I think throughout the Bay Area, I don't think anyone in the world is going to compete with them. But if we think about um, Colorado and Utah, they seem reasonable. And so I picked three different uh, comparison columns. The first is, this is all done on a per capita basis, so normalizing the population is research funding to our university systems. So Colorado gets $200 per person in the state, Utah 180, Montana 170. So you can see that compared to Utah, we get about 94% of the research dollars uh, that our universities get. Our GDP is, is $41,000 per person, um, which is 85% of Utah's, but this is the per capita venture funding. So Colorado gets $164 a person, Utah gets $278, and Montana gets $2.89. So we get somewhere between 57 to 96 times less venture capital than Colorado and Utah, respectively. Um, now, if you normalize the numbers to say, okay, if we got proportionally the same amount that we of uh, venture money that we do for the GDP and the, and the and the research funding, we'd be getting something like thirty-six to my little laser pointer died on me, thirty-six to seventy million dollars a quarter versus one million dollars a quarter. This is the data that inspired me to start um, raising capital because now maybe we don't deserve to get. 100% of the per capita dollars that those states have. Um, tell me, I mean, maybe we should, is it 50%, is it 10%? It just doesn't feel like 1% is, is a reflection of the capability of the people in this room or the, frankly, the people that will be moving here in the years to come. And so, uh, to me, this, this was like, this is an opportunity. And I don't believe that, you know, capital market efficiency explains that. That basically, the, the economist's interpretation of this is that everyone in Montana must be an idiot, you know, because there's nothing worth investing in. And I think, practically speaking, if you look around this room and you, you know, you see the talent that you meet every day, you know that's wrong. So something is fundamentally broken in the flow of capital as it relates to Montana. And what is that problem? So a couple more things just to talk about the state of the venture market by state. You look at Utah here, they have 1.65 VCs per company. It's the most overfunded or least competitive market uh, there is. Uh, Silicon Valley is, is down here. So you see all these states that have you know, way more you know, venture activity uh, than even Silicon Valley does. Um, and it just goes to show how far behind I think we are. Uh, and this is just a few slides talking about why this really matters. I talked about this in terms of the impact, the long-term impact by having no venture money being available to the, the state. This is uh, looking at the average earnings in advanced industries, which typically attract venture money. Uh, you can see non-advanced industries have been flat. We've seen a lot about this in the political environment lately about wages being stagnant. But advanced industries, you continue to see a decline, a, 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 an acceleration. Actually, it turns out it's five times as fast as the overall economy that are the job, the wage income that's growing from states, from economies, sorry, uh, that have uh, typically been venture backed. And that's true uh, not just at the high end of the education spectrum, the PhD and the professional degrees, but it's across the board. You can see that the blue lines are higher, all the way down to no secondary diploma down here. So when you don't have venture capital and you don't have companies that are being formed that are around this knowledge economy, uh, you're going to have a, you're going to have low wage issues, and that's something that uh, Montana I think has suffered from over the years. Um, this is interesting too. This is basically saying, for every job that's created, an advanced industry job, it supports more than two others. Um, now this is this is really interesting. I think in terms of if you guys build companies in the photonics or software space or biotech space, every job you're creating is creating another two jobs that are not related to your direct employers versus non-advanced economy jobs, where you don't see that kind of multiplier effect. Um, so this is a, another thing I was going through is like, well, we've all heard this one before, but if all these things are true about Montana, which is it's got good sales tax issues, it's a great place to live, um, business climate's good, we've got a AAA rating, uh, we have good STEM education, our public universities are, are growing, and then, well, maybe not both in enrollment, sorry Lance, but uh, Bozeman is. Uh, uh, 
why is there no money here? So the next thing I did is I, I did a bunch of surveys of about 30 different venture firms across the country and I asked them questions like, are you more or less likely to invest outside of your home market in the year to come? Have you invested outside of your home market in the prior 12 months? And trying to get a sense of, there's a kind of a cliche in venture capital, which is if you can't drive to the company, you don't want to invest in it because there's a sense that you need a lot of early oversight of the companies in order to help them grow. So if you're living in California and investing in the Montana companies, it, is, it would be challenging against that construct. So it turns out the direct flight issue is a major, major problem. Uh, people don't want to get on two planes to come to a meeting. So if you think about Colorado and Utah, we talked about them earlier, they have excellent airports. You know, Denver is a hub for United, obviously Salt Lake is a hub for Delta. You can get from Salt Lake to anywhere in the country in one flight, effectively, in terms of major markets. Montana, it's, that's not true. So the lack of direct flights is a direct liability for us to build our tech economy here. Um, now there's this mythical flight that's direct on United to San Francisco. Has anyone ever been able to get on it? Yeah. <laughs> a few people. I've never been able to get on it, so I know it exists in theory, but it, you know, hopefully that'll become uh, more. But I do think um, you know people kid me all the time about this, like maybe that's a, a blessing uh, versus a curse that people can't get here. But from an, purely from an economic perspective, I'm not talking about quality of life or everything. This is a problem, so we need to have direct flights. I've talked to the, the governor and the senators about this, and the challenge that they have from a public policy perspective is essentially if they funded minimum, re minimum revenue guarantees to Bozeman, they're, they're picking favorites with public money, uh, and they're not willing to do that. Bozeman's already kind of hated enough in the state if we started getting Montana money to fund direct flights to, to Bozeman, it could become a bigger issue. The good news for us is we have, you know, we have the Yellowstone Club, we have Big Sky, and, you know, I read recently they're going to build another 12 hotels up there. Someone's going to start paying for direct flights, you know, for those people to fill those hotels up. I think that issue, in my mind, goes away over the next, you know, four to five years, uh, I hope. Uh, the next two are interesting. I'll just go with this one. This ability to build a recruited team in Montana, there's still this, I, I think, prejudicial view of Montana that why would anyone who's really talented want to move there? And could you recruit good people to work in companies? I'm not talking about people that live here. I'm talking about the fact you live in New York City or San Francisco, and, and, you, and you're starting to worry about the risks of, of, of building a team. Could you recruit a really great superstar, absolutely good, not just relative to what's good here, to come and, and work in a Montana company? Well, when I was thinking about these, this feedback, I was like, that's a no-brainer. I know we can do that. I mean, people want to live here. The issue on that one I'm sure you're all familiar with is the trailing spouse concept, which is what's your spouse going to do? Um, and then the second one is redundancy of job opportunity. You know, if, especially if you're a senior and you take a VP level job or something, there's no, there's no, there's very little redundancy in the job market for similar jobs. So those are issues. Uh, how do you get a, a, both couples to find meaningful work, both people in the, in the couple I should say, and then how do you convince someone that if the job they come for doesn't work out, it's going to still be okay. But I think those are, those are mitigated as well. Then they have this other concept, which is uh, the probably finding another, probably finding another deal. And what that meant was, if it's a random event, you're going to come out for one company, and you don't believe that there's going to be a chance for a second company, you may not even make, make it worth to come for the first one. In other words, can you amortize your travel time? Can you amortize your knowledge of the market? Um, across multiple investments uh, and build a cluster, if you will, uh, for your firm or for yourself if you're an investor. But the number one, uh, and I don't really have these listed in order, but the number one reason that someone would not go into a new market was this one. If there isn't a local lead investor they feel comfortable working with, who can source these deals, who can structure the investment, and can provide supervisory oversight between board meetings, people aren't willing to come. Now you, you think about that, it's, it's obvious in hindsight really is that how are they going to be, how are you going to find the, the company? It's, it, it could be a random event, you meet someone at a conference, uh, but system, systemically speaking, the odds of them are they're not going to come. You may be sending emails in like a PDF executive summary saying, hey I want to raise money, here's my company, but they're not going to, unless they're going to be in Montana in the near term, they're not gonna, maybe take a phone call with you, maybe you go fly and see them. 
it just creates a, it's an artificial barrier, actually it's a, maybe it's a natural barrier, to them actually getting serious. The flip side is if there's somebody active in the local market that they feel they can trust, who's trying to filter through all the opportunities here, find good companies, um, put together a term sheet, uh, syndicate the balance of the round, whatever, you know, in this case I'm talking about me, that I'm not willing to take, uh, and then be able to call people and say, hey, we've got this great company, um, we've done a lot of work on it, we think we can identify the team that we need to hire, uh, here's the term sheet it's signed, you just need to come and read our diligence material, take some meetings, and do you want to join our syndicate? The odds of them saying yes to Montana deal, I think, go up significantly. So basically, the, the core insight for me was massively underfunded uh, and undercapitalized region beyond reason. The reasons are clear. There wasn't a local active venture capital firm in the market, and we have a few direct flight issues we need to sort through. But basically the bet was, okay, over the next 10 years, do I, do I think the direct flight issue gets solved? Do I think people feeling more comfortable moving to Bozeman, uh, worrying about job redundancy issues, does that get solved? Um, and so someone had to step up and, and be a firm that could represent Montana deals to the rest of the market. Um, and Rob and I, I remember talking to Rob when I first moved here um, a couple years ago, thinking, you know, saying, I was like, maybe I'll do that. So that's, that's the, very much what I've just gone through is literally the work I did personally to get comfortable that this made sense. Um, and um, the other thing I'll just tell you really quickly that people think is a big problem in Montana is that there aren't enough good deals and so you have an adverse selection problem. If you look, if you think about regional venture capital, um, it, it, basically you are uh, not, you don't have a, if, you're, if your region is defined as the Bay Area, you're probably, this is not a, a problem, but the number one reason why regional venture capital firms don't work is they have what's called parochial blindness. You don't see beyond your local market. So you have this kind of blinder view on it, and what you do is you find the best investment in your market, but it turns out it's the 19th best investment nationally. So you've done your job, you've found a really good company, but it's not competitive. And so the challenge I think for us as a firm it, to be successful is how do we maintain and deliver against our mission, which is to invest um, here while not falling prey to being blind to the best things that are happening uh, across a much larger geograph geography. Um, and so we've got some things in place we've tried to do that, including putting people on an investment committee that aren't, don't work at our firm but have a national footprint in terms of the deals they look at and provide a check and balance against that. And they can say, hey, Will, yeah, these are good people, but you know, there's 35 other companies that do this, and I don't think this, you know, this is not a good investment for you. So anyway, that's what we're trying to do. The other big concern is, you know, how do you sell companies that are in Mon that are based in Montana? And I did a, again another survey of corporate development executives um, from large public software companies, primarily, and these are the things that came back about would they make an investment, uh, would they buy a company in Montana? And so, the, you know, the first is you can read these yourself, but you know. Can you build a quality engineering team? And that actually has become interesting because I've gotten quite a few calls in the last year probably from people that are saying, hey, we just can't keep an engineer in the Bay Area. Um, it's really, really hard. If we open up a 10 to 15 person development office in Bozeman, do you think we could fill the office with good people? Um, and we're thinking about Portland and Boulder as the other two places. It turns out, um, uh, I think that, that that being on the list is really interesting. Like if you think about um, uh, like market share, this is, this is the way I think about it a little bit. If you're not gonna be in the Bay Area, but you wanna be in a tech-friendly community, what's the list? It used to be Austin was on the list, you know, Boulder, Portland, um, and uh, maybe Madison, Wisconsin, maybe a couple other places like that. I think Bozeman is becoming on that list, and I think Missoula uh, hopefully will, will continue to, to grow and be able to be on the list as well. But the way I think about it is, like, say there's 10 people who are thinking about not doing their next company in San Francisco, and if we can get one of those or two of those, like 10, 20 percent market share against Boulder or Portland, and we do that for five or six years, then we, we really move up the rankings on that list and we become, I think, a place where people really want to think about it. And whether that's a satellite office for a development group, whether it's an independently net new company, 
um, I think that that's how it starts. Um, so we talk about these outside magazine lists, best places to live. You know, it would be cool to be like the best place to start your next company. You know, is Bozeman competitive with Boulder now? And I think against Boulder, we have a lot of things going for us. I-70 is a nightmare. You know, a reasonable house in Boulder is like a couple million dollars. I mean, people think Bozeman is expensive, but you know, Boulder is definitely crazy. Uh, next couple of things, like, is the company standalone? This is right the right now scenario, I think. Is it, it's got enough critical mass to be standalone. We don't need to move it. And in fact, let's fold other businesses under it, you know, in the service cloud. Or does it need to be brought in and integrated? Um, and then again, there's our favorite one. You know, the executives don't want to take two flights to get here. Some of them have their own planes, but most people don't. So we need direct flights. That's the takeaway for me anyway. Um, skip that one. Here's a little bit about our focus. Now, when you have a geographic focus, it's really hard to say, well, we do Montana SaaS investments. It, uh, you know, it's like, okay, you have a null set there. Pretty Well, that's not true. You have a small set. Uh, healthcare, photonics, we have investments in these three areas right now. Um, ag sciences is something that's, I think, interesting. You know, there's this challenge, how do you feel you feed 10 billion people? I think Montana has a lot to say about that. I should say about the null set here, Montana SaaS companies who want to raise money, David. Uh, uh, anyway, we have, uh, we have some ag science and stuff that uh, we need to work on, I think uh, it should be interesting. So in our first fund, we'll probably have 12 to 14 companies. Um, we'll invest up to a million dollars in the first round, you know, maybe one to two, maybe more than that over the life of the round. These slides are done when I have less money. But, Really what we want to do is for every dollar we put in, try to syndicate maybe another dollar or two dollars with out-of-state investors, you know, represent our companies uh, to, to net new class of investors who want to come here. Um, the other good thing I should just say, it sounds like a joke, but there's a lot of venture partners that, are, that now have homes in Yellowstone Club. That's good. <laughs> They're flying to Bozeman all the time. They want to have investments in the local market. I mean, I think honestly, the Elson Club last three years has just taken off in terms of Bay Area money, which I think is really interesting uh, for us. But we want to own somewhere around 10 to 15 percent, unless you're in this room, then it's 40 or 50. Uh, uh, we have LPs that, um, that co invest with us on a couple of deals, and we've already done this. We, we bought some founder shares just to provide liquidity to the founders and uh, allow us to get a little bit more ownership. Um, so, I'll just go really quickly through our first three investments. They may be representative of, of what we mean specifically. This is our first investment. Uh, we put $400,000 in. We led a round that was a million two in July of last year. And this is a really exciting company. It's, it's a joint venture between Stanford and MSU. It focuses on replacing opioids as a way of treating long-term chronic pain. Uh, it's, since we've made this investment, it's incredible the amount of press this problem's gotten, you know, from whether Prince dying or, or just the, the gateway to heroin that's through uh, Oxycontin. Uh, so if this drug works, you can treat chronic pain without any habit-forming side effects. Uh, so if you're, you're talking about the veterans population, you know, you know, people that have injuries uh, uh, or um, medical issues that result in chronic pain, they have this terrible decision to make is do they suffer in pain or do they risk addiction? Uh, so this company, I think, could be absolutely enormous. Uh, it's led by this guy named Stan Abel, who uh, run, he sold three different biotech companies, retired to Paradise Valley, was talked out of retirement by the Stanford founding team, and said, we got something I think is really important. And then most, I think, from my perspective, most gratifying is that they have collaborated very actively with MSU. The head of research at MSU is the, joint, is the principal investigator, and we're doing a lot of our lab work uh, here at MSU in terms of early um, early work. So that's a, kind of a poster child for this kind of cross-fertilization across states that we hope to see in some of our companies. Um, Lance is sitting here. He's the VP Engineering for Cinevable. Thank you, Lance, for letting us invest with you guys. Uh, we led a, a million three four Series A in November. And, uh, and Cinevable is, I think, just a great story. I think a lot of you guys may know them, but um, the only white comedy or comedy that so far uh, who's come from Montana, uh, they, they left. I remember talking to the white comedy or people about them and they said when the founding team left 
Y Combinator and told them they were moving back to Montana, they all looked at each other and said, that company is dead. You know, that, they equated going to Montana with failure, um, which they were very pleased that they, they were self-aware enough to apologize for that and have been really impressed by the company that has been built uh, by Michael, Bruce, and John. Um, so we actually have invested a million one, it's our biggest investment, so no pressure wise. Uh, um, and we're really happy with, with, uh, with that one. And then we invested in a uh, wastewater treatment company in Missoula. So we have two investments in Missoula and one here so far. This, this is a fascinating problem. This is basically the problem with excess nutrients in our water systems. If you think about the Great Lakes region, for example, um, they have algae bloom every year, and like Lake, Lake Erie. Like last summer, the Toledo, Ohio, their whole water system was shut down because of this algae bloom. And basically, the way they treat excess nutrients today is they use a lot of chemicals. And the chemicals are meet, reaching a point where they, they don't really get to the level of, of phosphorus trace uh, and nitrogen um, part reduction that's required. So this is a, a new system that, that's being built. It's being tried right now in this, by the city of Chicago. Um, and the city of Chicago has a billion eight gallons of water that gets processed every day. And this technology uh, may play a really important role in solving that problem for the next three, four years. So, um, uh, so that's, that's basically uh, a little overview on who we are, what we've invested in so far, why we're in business in terms of the opportunity we saw here. Um, the number one thing that makes markets work is entrepreneurs. We very much, you know, feel like our success is a function of the people in this room and other rooms around the state that decide to start companies. Um, and, uh, you know, so far it's been a really fascinating experience for me. I, uh, I have a lot of confidence in the original thesis, going from just an idea to seeing it working. And, the quality of the people that are operating in the state today in terms of their absolute talent, their absolute ambitions, I think the impact we can have, uh, it's really gratifying. I think what's one, the most rewarding part about working in our market, in my mind, is if you think about the Bay Area, you know, literally, you know, you, if Yahoo's going to go away, like, it's not going to matter at all. Like, it's just going to be completely filled up by all these other companies, you know, it's like half the venture firms disappear. It wouldn't matter at all. But the work that each of you guys do today, you can literally see the imprint, you know, your own footprint on the market here. You know, the work that Rob's done on helping organize these dev conferences, um, you know, the work that Josh did running Schedulicity, or what Lance is doing was submittable. We're changing our community, and you can really, there's, there's a great level of satisfaction by being able to see the direct change that you're responsible for. It's like, why do we get up every day? You know, in the Bay Area, I imagine a lot of people, they get up every day, they're like, if I could go to work this whole week, this whole year, this whole month, nothing would change, you know? It, no one would miss me. And we have this opportunity, I think, here to, um, you know, work on a lot of hard work that's come before, but have direct feedback between the daily work we put in and the community we live in and the companies we work for in a way that I think many other markets don't have. And that's really motivating. So anyway, I'll stop there. And if anyone's got any questions, I'd be happy to take them.